about Shalom. Hey, boy, I'm hot. <laughs> Gotta bring it out here. All right. We're going to take a look at John chapter 6 today. That's our text. We have your Bibles. We're going to work out of that. And a little bit out of chapter 1, those are the main texts. You get a lot of reverb, too. All right. Before we get started, while you look up the text, let's have a quick prayer. Heavenly Father, be with us now as we open your word. May we see, understand, be blessed. And Jesus came and what he tried to show us. Be with us now is my prayer in Jesus' name. Amen. John the Baptist is dead now. Jesus has been preaching up in the Galilee area. People have been thronging him, mobs and everything. He gets news from the Baptist disciples. He's been beheaded. Well, you know, they are related. They're just not in the same business together. And so he lost a family member, and, and he'd been working in this crowd up in Galilee, and he thought, well, I'll try to get away a little bit and contemplate. You know, we do that when we lose family members. You know, we pull back, get with other people. And so he decided he's going to get in the boat, go across the Sea of Galilee from the west to the east side, not a big sea. You stand there on the shore, you, uh, on the shore there, but you can see the other side. It's just about three, three and a half miles across. And, um, but, you know, they get over there and they get away. And now he finds himself standing on the shores. They get up a little elevated area where they look down. And they can see the boats coming in, people following them over. You know, I guess if he wanted to get away, this wasn't the way to do it, you know? And uh, we've been studying Mark this quarter. Mark is quite simple. He starts off up in the Galilee area, and then he starts to work his way down through Samaria as he comes into Jerusalem. It's like it all could take place in one year. You notice that as you read through? And I think it's written that way in order to be a, uh, a source for a liturgical year that you could follow through the life of Christ in one year in a, co in a our congregation and just repeat it year after year. A lot of churches do that. And so I, I don't know if John had that in mind. Here in John, this is his... Uh, you know, when he goes to Jerusalem, it's his first time, as he goes there several times. But here he is, he's on the east side, what we call today the Golan Heights. And he's standing there, and he's standing next to Philip, and he sees the boats coming. And he says in verse 4, now the Passover, the feast of the Jews, was at hand. So it's not Passover yet, but it's real near. We know the kind of weather that they have at Passover in the spring because there their weather was very similar to the kind of weather we have here in Phoenix. You know, it's either hot or it's fire, you know. But you know how in the spring it cools down because as we get into the story here, they're told to sit down on the ground. Well, there's times of the year in Phoenix you don't want to sit on the ground. i just let you know this is that time of year. So he sees them coming in and he looks over at uh, Philip, sir. He says, Jesus, verse 5, was therefore lifting up his eyes and seeing that a great multitude was coming to him. And he said to Philip, where do we buy bread that these may eat? And in verse 6 he says, and this he was saying to test him, for he himself knew what he was intending to do. Well, two things out of this there. One is he asked Philip. He didn't ask the others. Uh, Philip, hometown was just up the road, right around the corner of the lake, walking distance. So if anybody's going to know where the bakery is, he would. And uh, so, and, and then it says, he tested him, knowing what he was going to do. This miracle, this feeding of the 5,000, 
is in the synoptics, all three, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, as well as John. And they all say it a little bit different. Remember here just a few weeks ago, we went through the feeding of the 5,000. And they noted that John had been beheaded. So we, we get that information there. And uh, so you, this verse here, where it says, knowing what he was going to do, is the only place that's found, is here in John. Because it wasn't like he was preaching all day to them. And then they came to him and said, hey, master, let him go so they could go in town and buy food. See, that's one of the translations. But Jesus knew he was going to feed them. In the other scripture, he says, feed them yourself. Why don't you feed them? And of course, they had no way to do it. Mark says, what, it's going to cost about 200 denarii to feed him. He had the same number Philip had. As Philip responds, he knows where the bakery's at. He says, it's going to take 200 denarii days, 200 days wages, but they all might get a little bit. And some people have tried to say, if you look at commentaries, oh, it was eight months worth of work, that kind of thing. You remember the Jews not only worked, didn't work on Sabbath, 52 days a year or whatever, they didn't work on those holidays. There were three major uh, times they had to travel to Jerusalem for feasts. And so you take this with the other festivals they have, the seven yearly festivals, that they, there's a lot of time off there. Plus, most of their work was day labor. So they didn't have a job every day. They may work a while consistently and then be off for a little bit until another job comes along. And so what Philip was really saying, he wasn't being technical here at all. He was simply saying that about a year's wage wouldn't be enough. And some think 300 is a year's wage. Well, maybe it was for some. It seems Philip was trying to say, hey, just to kind of get a context, a year's wage for most people wouldn't be enough to buy bread for this crowd. It kind of gives you an idea of the size of it. We say it's the 5,000. We know that doesn't include women and children. Could be 10,000, 15,000, we don't know. There are at least 10,000 men. I mean, 5,000 men. Uh, the other time he feeds it, talks about uh, feeding the 4,000. Now, remember when the Seraphonician woman came to Jesus, wanted Jesus to heal her daughter? What did, he, what did he say to her? It's not my time. You come, you know, I'm here to serve to the house of Israel, not you. And, you, and they have this little debate there. Well, it's interesting that the 4,000 are on the east side of the Lake of Galilee again, and it's Gentiles. He ministered purposely to the Gentiles. He does this kind of thing several times. Like the, uh, uh, the Roman commander, the, the, the centurion, the hero servant. I mean, he was called the Jews to the Jews to minister to them. But here he is helping a centurion, who, by the way, ended up having more faith than most of those in Israel. But, you know, but he was called to Israel, and yet he still reached out. And we learned there when we did Ephesians, what the great mystery of God was. Remember that? You didn't know it was going to be a test today, did you? You know, the great mystery of God is the body of Christ. And that included Gentiles, too, or the Goyim. So here he is, trying to get away. They all followed him over. And so he begins to teach them. In verse 8, one of his disciples, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, said to him, that there's a lad there with five barley loaves and two fish. Now, I know the pictures we see. They make the little fish. The fish were small fish, pickled fish and salt, and more like an hors d'oeuvre. And the barley is the lower quality we, uh, grain, not the wheat, barley. But he tastes this pittance, which someone commonly says, 
uh, that uh, said, but what are these for so many in verse 9? But evidently, it's enough for Jesus. Mm -hmm. You know, I, I think of ourselves, you know, we God calls us to all work for him, and we all have our sphere of operation, how we how we share the gospel and work for the church. And sometimes we think, you know, we have so little to give, so little talent, so little money, so little time, so little whatever. And it's enough that he can multiply that, given from a grateful heart. So don't feel that your work is diminished. So this person in the church is more important and doing more things and, and that you're not. You don't think that. And um, it's enough. If you give it willingly, he can bless that, multiply that in ways you don't know. You and I don't know. So, and I say this from experience because, you know, when I was out for 22 years and I came back, February of 98, I wasn't even looking to be on the, to become an itinerant preacher. That wasn't even on my mind. My, that wasn't on the table. And that December in 1999, I got a call to go speak in January. And from that point, God had returned to me without me even asking. He returned to me a preaching ministry, Amen. what he had originally called me to all those years before. And so that's what I mean. He takes that little bit. Yeah. And I don't have a church. I don't preach, you know, every Sabbath to somebody. You know, I may go to a class and teach. And, but he takes that little bit yeah. and uses me. And he doesn't use me because, you know, hey, oh, Carl's so smart, so great, we're going to use him. No. You know, God called me into the ministry, or to ministry, to save me. You know, where would I be without it? And so we see this, an operation here. Jesus is doing something interesting here. Is he's done it there in Matthew chapter 5. He's doing it here again. He's going to begin to show the people through the feeding that he's the new Moses. Now, that's important for them to grasp. It, it, keep your fingers there. Go back to chapter 1 of John. We're down to verse 19. Now John the Baptist is by the river baptizing. And the Pharisees come and the Jews come down to meet him. They, they have to get, they're sent down, they gotta get a report about who this guy is. Verse 19. And this is the witness of John when the Jews sent to him priests and Levites from Jerusalem to ask him, who are you? And he confessed and did not deny, and he confessed, I am not the Christ. I am not Messiah. It's almost as if they barely got the words out of their mouth, and he wanted them to know, I'm not Messiah. Well, they knew that Elijah would come before the Messiah. So they asked him naturally, are you Elijah? And he says, I am not. And then they asked, are you the prophet? Now, the King James, who's all got King James here? Okay, what's your say? I say, the prophet, what do you say? I that, that, yeah, I like that. That reminds me of the uh, TV series, That Girl. <laughs> you're not just a girl or the girl, you're that girl. Be really specific. Yeah. Are you that prophet? You know, what do you mean by that? Are you that prophet? What prophet are we looking at? This is a reference back to Deuteronomy. This is when Moses is getting ready. It's a series of three sermons that have been cobbled together. Book of Deuteronomy is the second reading of the law. He's preparing to go die before they go into the land. So he wants to prepare them. And in chapter 18, twice, verse 15 and 18, he basically says to them, God is going to send you a prophet like unto me. He will raise him up from among the people. Him you will listen to. So it's not just a prophet. It's a prophet that's like Moses. Now, Isaiah wasn't like Moses. He was a prophet, but he wasn't like Moses. 
What was Moses? He was a prophet, but he was a redeemer, deliverer. God sent him down to redeem them out of captivity, right, to Egypt, and then to deliver them to the promised land. So God's going to send you another redeemer, deliverer, a prophet like unto me, Moses says. This is who Jesus is. He's the redeemer, deliverer. He's not coming to take the people out of a, a new Egypt and deliver them from the bondage of whoever they hand they happen to be in at the time, but he's come to deliver us from the bondage of sin and deliver us to the heavenly Canaan. It's a much bigger picture. And so this is what he's doing when he feeds them. He's feeding them on purpose, remember, knowing what he was going to do. It was purposely. You know, we studied the parables in Mark 2. Uh, that's the, that was a great lesson that week. And it had to do with the outsiders, right? Remember the end of chapter 3? Jesus' mother and Jesus' brothers are coming to where he's at in his house, and they want to send the boys in to give a message to somebody saying, uh, get that crazy guy out of there. Jesus. He's lost his mind. Jesus is on the inside trying to give a message, and they're on the outside. Now it's the difference between the outsiders and the insiders. And when he gives a parable, always says, listen or hear. But then they press in and ask the questions. And those who pressed in and asked the question, he never says hear or listen, because they've already had. But the ones who stayed out and didn't press in, they didn't get the full story. They came into Jesus, remember, they asked him, tell us what it means about the sowers. So are the seeds. Tell us what that means. So they heard the story like everybody else did, but they pressed in. When you press in, you get the goods, right? You get a deeper message, deeper understanding. Well, Jesus is using that same technique here. He's going to feed them like giving a parable. Now they're going to either get fed and go home, or they're going to press in. And it's going to be. So the feeding itself is not what we're looking at. It's the means to get to what we really need to look at. Uh, those who taught our children, Sabbath school, you know, you teach them about the feeding of the 5,000, nice little story, and you come down to the end of it, and that's it. And you miss the bottom line, the climax. You know, we got to get to the climax. Why did he feed the 5,000? What was he trying to show these people? They just weren't near Circle K, so he had to feed them. Yeah. There was another reason. Yeah. That's what he was setting up. Another reason. If they would hear. What's the Hebrew word for hear? Some of you know it. Shema. Yeah, Shema. And that just doesn't mean here. My wife would wish I would Shema. Any, any, any husbands there know what I mean. You never listen to me, she says. I hear you. Right, yeah, you can hear somebody, but do you listen? Listen with meaning, intent, on purpose. So that's what, that, that's, so that's what he's saying to them. He wants them to hear what's going on. He wants them to see what's happening. So let's get back over here to chapter 6. Okay, where am I? So they're asking him about the food. They found this little lunch. They said, this is nothing. Well, like I said, it's enough for Jesus. So verse 10, Jesus says, have the people sit down. Now it makes sense because we know what time of year it is. Otherwise, I'd be saying, are you kidding me? And it gets hot there. So now there was much uh, grass in the place. That's good. And so the men sat down in number of about 5,000. Now Jesus therefore took the loaves, and having given thanks, he distributed uh, to those who were seated, and likewise the fish, and as much as they So as he passed it into the hands of his disciples and those, they passed it off. It just kept multiplying. Yeah. And that's the picture you get. 
And so, and as much as they want it. They want to go back for seconds. They had seconds. So, and when they were filled, he said to his disciples, gather up the leftover fragments that nothing may be lost. So they had leftovers. They gathered it up. They didn't squander it. And so they gathered to themselves about what? They filled 12 baskets. So these are the big baskets for harvesting. And with fragments from bar fried barley loaves, which were left over as well as the fish. And it says, when therefore the people saw the sign which he had performed, they said, get this, this is of truth, that prophet, whom is to come into the world. Jesus, therefore perceiving, verse 15, that they were intending to come and take him by force to make him king, withdrew again to the mountain to himself, for, for, uh, to himself alone. So he sets this up. He knows they're going to respond just the way they did. They perceived he was that prophet. He's the Messiah. And they're going to make him king. And Jesus doesn't confront them doesn't correct them, but he hides in the hills. That's the end of the story. We can go home now. See what I mean? You just can't do the 5,000 feeding. Why did he duck in the hills? What was the purpose of that? But it's not given that main parable, and they didn't get the goods yet. Then it gets worse, just, just getting in the hills. It says, now when evening came, his disciples went down to the sea, and after getting into the boat, they started to cross the sea to get to Capernaum, and it had already become dark, and Jesus had not yet come to them. He hadn't come down from the hills or nothing. And the sea began to be stirred. They have these little storms on the Sea of Galilee that could be pretty violent. Uh, because a strong wind was blowing, remember they were roaring in place for hours, not getting anywhere. You know, so, uh, and so they're, they're down there. And then uh, when therefore, verse 19, when they had rolled about, what, three or four miles, well, I don't know if that's the correct interpretation. I said, like, the sea was only five, three and a half miles across. And they were going in a diagonal up to Capernaum. It says, anyway, they, they beheld Jesus walking on the sea coming near to them, and they were afraid. And he said to them, don't be afraid. He says, it's me. And so they were willing, therefore, to receive him into the boat. And immediately, this is how I want to travel. This is Star Wars, or Star Trek. Immediately, the boat was at the land to which they were going. Wow. Stepped in the boat, boom, you're there. Yeah. It's like when Philip was... Uh, working up in uh, Samaritza uh, with the Samaritans. And God sent him down with the Ethiopian. He was there. He walked by him, said, hey, can you know what you're reading? How would I know? And somebody explains it, he explains it. They baptize. After the guy comes up out of the water, Philip disappears again. Okay, Philip, back to your old job. <laughs> and what a way to travel. I think we're gonna travel in heaven that way too. So, yeah, I don't care how many start, uh, uh, um, how many uh, light years away something is, we'll just turn around and be there. So, so anyways, so there they are, they're at Capernaum. And, and where, where, where's the man here? Okay, the next day, verse 22. So here we are. Well, the next day, he had hidden the, hidden the hills after the, he got the, he fed everybody. He knew they were going to come and try to make him king. So he ditched that, didn't confront him, didn't explain it, didn't know Jesus. The disciples leave sometime later in the boat. They just saw them leave. Jesus catches up with them a while later. So what's going on with this whole story? Where's the big message come in? 
So here they are, verse 22. The next day the multitude that stood on the other side of the sea saw that there was no other small boats there except one, and that Jesus had not entered with his disciples into the boat, but that his disciples had gone away alone. There came other small boats from Tiberias, from the west side, who came near to them, to the place where they uh, ate the bread after the Lord had given thanks. And when the multitude therefore saw that Jesus was not there, nor his disciples, they themselves got into the small boats and came up to Capernaum seeking Jesus. So they're going after him. Now, that's not everybody. That's just the people who are pressing in. Okay. And when they found him on the other side of the sea, they said to him, Rabbi, when did you get here? That's an interesting statement. And Jesus never responded to that statement. Jesus answered them and said, Truly, truly, I say to you, you seek me, not because you saw signs, but because you ate of the loaves and were filled. Basically, they followed him over there to get a free lunch. That's what they were, they were following him at. No, no deep theology here. They just wanted free food. Okay. But he tells them, verse 27, do not work for the food which perishes, but for the food which endures to eternal life, which the Son of Man shall give to you, for on him, the Father, even God, has set his seal. He said similar things here back with the woman at the well back in chapter 4. She was looking for water. And the water he was wanting to give her was everlasting water. Amen. Water she would never thirst from again. You know? Same thing here with the food. Now here in chapter 7, the very next chapter, he's at the temple. He's on the last day of the uh, festival of booths. It's seven days, but this is the eighth day. They added a day. Water purification rites. It's taken right out of Ezekiel, chapter 47, verses 1 to 12. And now all the priests would get together, and they would, like a bucket br uh, brigade, pass this pitcher of water along, pitchers of water. And they would pour it by the door to the temple, by the south side of the altar and it would flow down the drain, down the Kidron, go south toward the Dead Sea. Remember that in Ezekiel, he talks about the river of life that brings the Dead Sea back to life. This is the symbol that Jesus was the living water. Amen. And Jesus is standing there in the crowd telling people that he is that water. Anyone who drinks of him will never thirst. And we, get, we get this center of drinking water, and of bread. And so, he's telling them to work for this eternal food. Now, they're thinking to themselves, yeah, yeah, we won't have to keep following them around if we can do this ourselves, seek this eternal food. So they asked him the question. They said, therefore, to him, verse 28, what shall we do that we may work the works of God, that we may make what do we do? And for a lot of Adventists, that's a good Adventist question. Because what do we do? We're about doing, not about being. <laughs> you know, we want to do something. Yeah. And what do we do to work the works of God? And Jesus answers them. He meets them where they're at. He doesn't correct them. He meets them right where they're at, where God meets us. All of our brokenness and messiness. He says, verse 29, he answered them and said to them, this is the work of God, that you believe in him whom he has sent. That's the work of God, that you believe, have faith in. It's not a point in time he's talking about here. One time belief. It's a continuing, ongoing belief. You believe in him. Who's him? Jesus Christ whom God had sent. That's our work. The work is really work. It's a, kind of like 
a little pun there. What is the work? It's a work of faith. It's not something you have to go do, but to have faith in it. Faith is not just belief, it includes Faith is not just mental assent. It does include mental assent, but it's trusting. Do you trust Jesus? Believe in him whom God had sent. When people teach the gospel and they use the Pauline gospel, especially out of Romans chapter 3, verses 24 to 28, they say that this gospel that Paul teaches is not the same gospel that Jesus taught. Well, what did we just read here? This is the work of God that you believe, ongoing belief. That's why in the King James it says, ye believe. It's not a point in time. You believe in him whom God, who him, believe in him whom God has sent. That's the work. And that's the gospel. If we believe in Christ whom God has sent, we have faith in him. He says in Romans chapter 3, verse 24, actually verse 25, that the cross showed that God was just. See, back when man sinned, back in chapter uh, 3 there of Genesis, he, he didn't show judgment. He didn't show justice. He showed mercy. But now at the cross, he shows justice. And so the cross demonstrated that God was just and the justifier of those who would have faith in Jesus or what he did on the cross. And what, we, what did he do on the cross? It's having faith in that work is what's going to save us. He didn't say, here's a long laundry list of things to do. Get with it. If you would trust in what I did on the cross. He's basically saying, look, folks, what I did here on Calvary to propitiate, to appease the law, if you'll have faith in what I did, you won't have to die. I'll take the law. And that's what he shed his blood for. To all those who would have faith on what he did on the cross. That's our work. This is the work of God, that you believe in him whom God has sent. The gospel is the same. Jesus is speaking from it, on it from one side, whereas Paul's on the other side of the cross looking back and speaking on it there in Romans chapter 3 and other places. 2 Corinthians 5. Uh, 1 Corinthians 1 and 2. So, it's the same message of having faith in Christ, the one who was sent. That was why he fed the 5,000. Because in there, they recognized the miraculous feeding. When you read that in the text as you go on, as he's dealing with them. And he wanted to show them he was the new Moses. And Moses had fed them in the wilderness. But as he corrected them, it wasn't Moses, but God who fed them. And when they saw the miraculous feeding, they knew this was messianic stuff. This was that prophet. And that's why they went to lay hands on him. But he wanted them to know it was a bigger picture than that. It's not just exile out of your current bondage, but the bondage of sin the ultimate delivery to the promised land. So he needed to get that across to them. And so he knew, they knew then that this was the Messiah. He did that in Matthew when he did the Beatitudes. He's on the mountain and he's given the Beatitudes. That's again, shows himself as the new Moses. And so people will know by what authority. Moses was the greatest prophet they had. And Jesus, it says, may comment about that, yet one greater than Moses is here. And that was Christ. And so that was the message he gave. Now after that, he says to them, they said, therefore, to, to Jesus in verse 30, what then do you do for a sign that we may see and believe you? What work do you perform? What do you think Jesus said? 
Uh, where were you when I fed the 5,000? <laughs> well, what works do you think I need to perform? Yeah. But he, he kind of eschews them. Our fathers ate the manna in the wilderness, they said. As it is written, he gave them bread out of, out of heaven to eat. And Jesus therefore said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, it is not Moses who has given you the bread out of heaven, but it is my Father who gives you the, the true bread out of heaven. And here's the crossover. He just didn't give them the bread out of heaven. He gave them the true bread. And the true bread is what? Jesus himself. He says, verse 33, for the bread of God is that which comes down out of heaven and gives life to the world. And they said to him, Lord, even more, give us this bread. And Jesus said to them, verse 35, I am the bread of life. He who comes to me shall not hunger, and he who believes in me shall never thirst. But I said to you that you have seen me, and yet do not believe. All the Father gives me shall come to me. And the one who comes to me, I will certainly not cast out. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my own will, but the will of him who has sent me. And this is the will of him who sent me, that of all that he has given me, I will lose nothing, but raise it up in the last day. All those who believe, he promises on three occasions here to raise them up in the last day. Amen. He didn't say you go to heaven when you die. He's going to raise you up in the last day. Yeah. And he's not talking about raising up ghosties, spirit, but tangible people. That's in, the, that's in the language of resurrection. Even in the ancient Jewish mind, a resurrection was a physical, tangible resurrection. And I will raise you up in the last day, the promise of life. And so through this feeding of the 5,000, he shows them who he is. He shows them where they need to put their trust. And he shows them that he is the secure bread from heaven. The one who will eat my flesh and drink my blood will not die. But I will raise him up in the last day. People couldn't seem to get their minds wrapped around it. He's got to be talking about cannibalism. And so that day, many people... Be left off following them because they couldn't understand what he was saying. The disciples were confused. He asked them, are you going to leave too? Well, they're thinking in their head, we probably would have, but we don't know where else to go. We know you have the truth. And they're saying, we're just simply going to stay here. Confused, but we're going to stay right here. You ever had that feeling? Yeah, I'm confused, but where do I go? But they trusted him, and he would show them. But this is the turning point here, right here in chapter 6, where Jesus now begins to confront in John. Most of the Gospel of John really deals with the last. I mean, they're conspiring to kill him after he heals the uh, 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 guy there at the pool of, at the, at the pool of uh, Siloam and tells him to pick up his bed and walk away, the invalid. And after that, they really, it's on. He heals Lazarus, and it's done. You know, he brings him back to life. I mean, that's all over with the Shelton. So the whole thing really deals with a lot of the, uh, right up to the Passion and the Passion, most of John, as big as the book is. And that's where we find ourselves. This is the big change, where they begin to look at him a little differently. You begin to look at him as a, as a Messiah. And that's why he came into the temple. You know, when we did that lesson, you know, we, we say, well, Zechariah says he came in, there, your king comes in lowly riding on the back of an ass or a mule, or donkey, actually. Well, why? Why did Zechariah prophesy that? Why did he come in? He, if he's coming in as a king, why on the back of a lowly animal like that? We're not a great stallion from prancing in. And you remember back there in Samuel when Solomon had to leave because of the civil war going on. One of David's younger sons were trying to take over 
going to have himself crowned and inaugurated king. And so David had to get Solomon in town to get him anointed, inaugurated as king. And he brought him in on a mule. And they used that ever since for the kings of Israel, of the house of David. And so when Jesus, who didn't confront anybody, remember, he'd heal somebody and say, now don't tell anybody. He's right now in their face. He comes into the temple writing on this thing, and the people know exactly who he is, and they know exactly what he's doing. And they lay out the palm branches, and if they didn't have palm branches, they laid out their robes. And they sang hallelujah, or hosanna, because they knew he was the king coming. And you know, I think Jesus could have taken the kingdom right there. But, he, but they knew who he was by that as he came in. They knew he was the Messiah. And you know what? They're without excuse. Some of those same people who may have been crying out, uh, Hosanna, hallelujah, may have been in the same crowd that was calling for his crucifixion. Not all of them, but some of them. That's how back and forth we can be. But now they're without excuse, because they know when they look back, the king had come into town, and he was there with them. That section there, Mark shows us where he was confronting them. Oh, they may have confronted him. Or what do you say about a coin, about paying taxes, all this stuff. But Jesus put himself there in their face. And he confronted them all the way up. That's why when they came to him at the garden, he says, I've been in the temple all day. I've been in your face. And you could have taken me then. But you've got to come in the night. So here's the big turning point. He is Messiah. He is the second Moses. The one who's bringing the true deliverance. He's not just there to feed 5,000 people. And he is there to feed all of us. Deliver us to the kingdom. Let's pray. Dear Father, we thank you so much for the promise of your deliverance. Promise of your restoration. May we take this as we share the message of your salvation with others. Go forth to build the kingdom. Prepare for your coming. We may uh, be joyous in sharing this message. We know Jesus, when he, when he gave the words to... Uh, Nicodemus said, I come to save the sinners. He didn't come to save good people. And so as we're out there giving the message to people who need to be saved, who are not good people, we're making neighbors for ourselves in heaven. These are the people we're going to live with. This is the community that will be eternal. And we ask you, Father, to take us and bless us to go forth to be a blessing to others as we prepare for Christ to come. He came here the first time to save us through his death on the cross. The second time, he's not coming to die, but he's coming to bring us home. Bless us, Father, as we go from this place. In my prayer in Jesus' name, amen.